Everyone's favorite lawyer. All the lawyer jokes are not about this man here. Out of all the great, amazing, uh, inspirational speakers we saw today, most of them had um, kind of gushy hard eyes over this man here, uh, John Conroy, and for, for lots of reasons, and we'll go over them. Um, another reason, another person we're glad to have in our corner for sure, uh, John's been practicing law since 1972 and was appointed Queen's Counsel in 1996. Um, oh, also I should mention, he's the president of Normal Canada, so let's give him a round of applause as he snuck up on stage there for this great weekend full of amazing speakers. Every year it gets better and better, so thank you. My mind is always buzzing. <laughs> um, you practice criminal defense lawyer as well as uh, related constitutional, administrative, and other civil matters. In 2014, he was awarded the BC Civil Liberties Association Liberty Award. Um, for his excellence in legal advocacy, and in 2016 was awarded the Ed McIsaac Human Rights in Corrections Award. Um, you have appeared in the courts at all levels, including several appearances before the Supreme Court of Canada, notable, very notable cases that you guys may have heard of, uh, Michelle Rainey, um, uh, Watermelon, who was mentioned before, um, also counsel to the BC Compassion Club, the Vancouver Island Compassion Club, and the West Coast Prison Justice Society uh, that runs the BC Prisoners Legal Services. Um, John has acted in numerous cannabis and other drug cases and as well as a wide variety of criminal and prison law matters in test cases. He is on the board of the Pivot Legal Society and is counsel to Vandu in its efforts to keep open safe injection facility, um, the safe injection facility insight, which is getting more and more important every day, unfortunately. Um, he's also the founding president of Normal Canada since 1976, is in the only, the only Canadian member of Normal Legal Committee in the USA. So thank you for being our representative there. Um, John's the lead counsel in Allard versus Her Majesty the Queen, and um, has many successes to tell us about. And again, thank you so much, John, for the great weekend. Give us our closing remarks. Thank you very much. Well, I think the important thing is, even though I don't like the model that they're, they're coming up with, at least we've got lots more details to find out, but uh, you know, in 1972, when I was called to the bar, we had something called the Ledane Commission. Justice Gerald Ledane chaired this uh, commission that looked into the legalization of cannabis and back then said that the maximum penalty for trafficking should be on indictment five years, on summary conviction six months. Uh, finally, we have a government that is going to at least, what we say, hybridize that offense so that there'll be a summary conviction and indictable, but their max is 14 years. And that's just ridiculous. And it isn't uh, in tune with reality. And it has other negative consequences in terms of sentencing and, and people going to prison and not being able to get conditional sentence orders and so on. So there are important criticisms and so on, but it's in the right direction. It is legalization of sorts. And if the most important thing I think I can say, and it follows what Jonathan but where fits in with what Jonathan was just talking about, is to remember that those who use cannabis, whether for medical or other purposes, <coughs> excuse me, are ambassadors for this community until at least it goes through legalization and we demonstrate by the type of conduct that's been demonstrated for now years and years that this is not the problem that they keep thinking that it is or going to be. This fear <laughs> or things that they come up with, you know. So it's very, very important, especially novice users and intermittent users, but as Jonathan points out, even those who feel they to are tolerant, remember, ask others, don't just rely on your own judgment. But the last thing we need is somebody being charged and there being a whole pile of media about somebody having caused somebody's death or serious bodily harm by driving while your ability to do so is impaired by alcohol or a drug. That's the criminal code 
offense that's existed since as long as I've been a lawyer. So we just have to demonstrate that, you know, there's been lots and lots of people who've been driving under the influence of cannabis for long, long periods of time, and there haven't been an increased crash risks, even in Washington State and Colorado, apparently, from the studies. But it, and 97% of the people uh, impaired driving cases, according to Bill Blair, are alcohol. And so we're talking 3% of all impaireds are all other drugs, and so, I think that we're more looking at a situation of akin to distracted driving uh, as a result of being under the influence of cannabis. And so that's something that's pretty difficult to test for. And we know that the problems from people looking at cell phones and texting and so on has become a bigger problem than impaired driving, apparently. And so anyway, it's, it, it, the, the message is Please continue to act as responsibly as most of you always have to demonstrate that we can do this and have people from the community become involved with the LPs as we heard on the earlier panel. Um, realize that that is the transition into the legal process. The feds control manufacturing. The provinces control distribution. Local government has a role to play in terms of zoning. So all of these things you haven't had to do in the gray or illicit market, these are unfortunately part of the problem of legalizing and regulating, and, and it can be costly, especially initially, to implement it all and get it in place. But that's the objective, is to make it legal, the whole market, not just part of it, the whole market, so that it is a perfectly legal thing and we're on the road, but we still have uh, some distance to go. As, as again, Jonathan said, the problem with the whole impaired driving thing is the fairness of it um, because of tolerance. <coughs> and so trying to make sure that whatever device people come up with in terms of nanogram levels uh, is fair in, in that the, it does have something to do with the person's ability to drive, which usually involves testing motor coordination skills and so on. In fact, you know, the, the best way to test for impaired driving, as I understand it, is for them to have driving simulators in the back of vans and people have to go in, sit in the simulator and be tested for their ability to drive. But, you know, I think that's available in some places. Why don't they have more of that? Uh, because that's an important thing that we want to, to prevent. And, you know, my experience as a lawyer now over 45 years, but mostly in the last 10 or 15 years, smell is one of the causes of legal intervention, whether it's the inspectors because the neighbors have complained, trying to have a barbecue with the kids in the summer, and there's this waft of marijuana smell that they don't like, and, or they certainly, maybe not completely rationally, but emotionally react about their kids smelling it and things like that. There's, the law is that you shouldn't cause a nuisance to your neighbors. And, and it's actually a, what we call a tort in the law. And people could sue you technically, you know, it's gotta be worthwhile usually to do it, but you, we don't want people in the neighborhoods complaining about us using cannabis or growing cannabis. We want people supporting that we can do it without impacting negatively on our neighbors. And so these are the things we particularly have to demonstrate now with this forward momentum that we've got, even though we don't like lots of parts of it and don't think that it, it goes far enough. So. What to do? I think, you know, the key thing is the market has to be flooded. And so that means people have to be able to grow their own, whether it's medical or otherwise. We have to have stores because lots of people don't want to grow their own <laughs> or if somebody grow for them. And so we have to get this distribution thing down. Uh, but we also, as we talked earlier, ha have to get this production thing down and get all the craft people in there 
uh, you know, hopefully overcoming this resistance. Uh, people have this thing about corporations and big business and so on. You know, um, sure, we always hear about the abuses, just as if you practice criminal law or if you watch the news, you always hear the abuses in terms of crime and so on. Um, there's lots of big corporations that actually do some pretty good things and contribute in huge ways uh, to helping uh, in various areas. And, um, you know, I think we have to focus our criticisms on legitimate things, not just because they're a big corporation. And realize that often people incorporate for all kinds of legal reasons that, uh, <laughs> you know, we don't have to concern ourselves with. So, you know, it is all part of bringing in the law, bringing in, in, in a subject to the rules situation uh, that uh, is to develop. And the more people, I think, from the community who do become involved in the existing legal thing, uh, the more likely it then eventually will become a model that all of us think is the correct model. And, and, it, and that's how it's going to play out. Sure, we've still got some things going on in the courts, um, I've got a case, we've just filed our a reply to the Supreme Court of Canada out of Saskatchewan involving a fellow called Neary who uh, we convinced the judge, he was trafficking in 25 pounds and uh, we convinced the uh, sentencing judge uh, to take into account that the government said they were going to legalize and that that affected the, the, the sanction, the punishment, uh, when you punish Courts take into account are supposed to denounce the conduct. You see, we denounce conduct that the government has in writing said it's going to legalize. Surely the emotional, as the judge put it, decibel level has gone down. And the same with uh, deterring others, you know, uh, general deterrence. So the judge accepted that and gave him uh, probation uh, because he couldn't give him one of the house arrests things because of the maximum, uh, 14 year uh, max takes that away. And uh, the Crown appealed and the Court of Appeals said, oh no, the judge was wrong, he shouldn't have taken legalization into account and uh, our efforts to get back the conditional sentence order were dismissed. Um, so, and he got 15 months. So we got him bail, fortunately, and uh, so that's on its way to the Supreme Court of Canada on the issues of whether taking away the conditional sentence order goes too far and violates constitutional rights, and uh, what a judge can take into account under the existing law in sentencing somebody for conduct. Uh, surely the judge shouldn't be blinded to what's going on in reality out there in the community or be precluded from taking that into account, so, is obviously our argument. So that's one that's coming up. You heard a bit about the Toronto injunctions. I'm not, uh, I, w I have been involved in the early stages and, and but not as much and the, the main people involved are going to be Kirk Tucson and Paul Lewin. Um, I may play some role. It's uh, it maybe a bit uh, premature, but <laughs> we'll see what happens. Uh, I certainly uh, 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 was involved in, in uh, helping frame what we think the issue is, which as uh, Jack said earlier on, the omission in the ACMPR, the failure to include uh, reasonable access by way of stores and dispensaries is the constitutional defect in the ACMPR. And so that's, I think, in a nutshell, the, 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 the argument, remembering that Allard was the omission of allowing people to grow or have somebody grow for themselves. And that, Justice Phelan found, was the omission that resulted in the MMPR being unconstitutional. So that's the, uh, the basic line in terms of these constitutional arguments uh, that are going on. And, and, and uh, a big thing, I hope, uh, and I'm, I, I was really pleased to hear, uh, in terms of the LP panel, the number of people who have been involved in the industry and even who've run afoul of the law in the past, being able to come in and participate in the new legal regime and not be prejudiced by it. That, I think, is uh, a huge, important thing in terms of the transition. 
those who've been convicted and sentenced have served their sentences. They've been punished. Um, they should uh, apply for pardons and get rid of their records if they can. Uh, there's some good new law out there that uh, should be helpful in that regard. Uh, but uh, we say that shouldn't be a, a bar. Um, Sure, there may be some individual circumstances and the, they'll always have some security issues that may arise, but we have to get rid of this uh, black market thinking uh, type concept of uh, how uh, if we don't have all, some of these rules that it's going to be diverted into the black market. Unfortunately, the models they've come up with aren't going to eliminate the black markets. We know what's happening in Washington State and, and, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, mentioning Washington State and Colorado, there the uh, impaired level in uh, Washington State is presumed five nanograms, which is a real problem for the medical patients. In Colorado, it's five nanograms presumed, but rebuttable. And so this two and four that Jonathan, or two and five that Jonathan mentioned, um, th there's going to be litigation over that, especially if it's presumptive and not rebuttable. It's just not going to stand up in terms of fair process. But um, uh, that, that is, the, is the challenge, is to... Uh, and so, you know, the big problem is trying to get the governments of all levels to come up with better understanding of how the industry works in order to regulate it in a way that there will be not only a continuing sufficient supply for medical patients who are not growing for themselves and who are accessing through the licensed producers, uh, but for this coming legal market, if they you know, want to try and control uh, everything from the beginning to end, um, somehow cooperatively between the feds and the provinces, uh, it'll be a minor miracle if they don't include the existing industry. And so that is, would be my major plea, would be to say, look, you've got the industry, bring them in, license. You may have individual circumstances where there may be a problem, but you, know, you have a licensing system where everybody can apply. And, and uh, you know, I hope uh, the craft growers who haven't looked at maybe being able to do it for one of the bigger LPs, you know, that a model maybe develops where you can have uh, multiple different places where the individuals do their uh, current growing and have them simply inspected or whatever, <laughs> you know. But let's, let's get moving to get the existing industry that does provide the existing supply <laughs> to the population. We, we all know that uh, Colorado uh, is making a huge amount of tax dollars, as is Washington State. Uh, through legalization, and so that that helps provide funds to deal with many of these costs and to try and keep the price down so that there's no interest in any illicit aftermarket and so that people and patients can get it at the same, uh, same time. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't realize I dropped the mic. So, um, what else? Um, being ambassadors, continuing to show how positive marijuana smokers are compared to, uh, or users are compared to uh, alcohol. And there's such a huge difference between impairment by alcohol and impairment by cannabis. But at the same time, uh, please, we don't want any incidents. So uh, it's going to be interesting, as I said earlier, how it plans out. Um, we've got Toronto doing these raids and charges and stuff, which is, uh, you know, we thought something of the past. Uh, and we've got Vancouver. It's always been a bit of a cocoon, I suppose, BC, on this issue. But uh, taking a much more uh, positive, uh, constructive approach of uh, regulating in terms of zoning and so on, uh, in anticipation of what's coming down the pike. And so. It's hard to imagine an LCB model in coming into play in British Columbia. Uh, you know, it, it may be that in the government department, the LCB becomes the government department that issues the licenses, which is sort of the Washington State thing. But it's not, 
owning the buildings and staffing the and so on and so forth. They're like the private liquor stores that, that we have in BC, which you don't have in Ontario. But the you know the so it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out in the very near future between now and next July. Um, and I don't understand the reticence on the part of the provinces in claiming they need more time when they're the ones who are going to make way most of the taxes. And, you know, as long as they tax reasonably so that you don't have the guy on the street corner saying to you as you try to go into the dispensary, hey, I'll sell it to you without the taxes. That's what happened in Colorado because they taxed it too high. And so people have learned over time that you tax low and then you can increase it as the demand you know, enables it. Uh, and so we pay 10% GST, I think, and 5% HST or vice versa, something like that on alcohol, and certainly in British Columbia, that's 15%. Uh, I think that's not unreasonable. Um, but again, the problem in Washington State apparently is the, the tax and the the cost of setting up and complying with all the rules and regulations. So they just got to learn that they need to have a model that works, not one that continues to be so restrictive out of unbounded basis uh, and, and, and get with the program, bearing in mind, as we've all said and we repeat over and over again, <laughs> If you look at the problems from alcohol and the deaths and all the rest of it, they are phenomenal. It's our number one drug problem. If you look at the deaths from tobacco, <laughs> it's huge the number of deaths every year from tobacco. And, you know, then we've got all the other drugs. And I remind you, if you go into your pharmacy, you'll see the sign that says 80,000 kids got high last year on their parents' drugs. Lock up your cabinets, throw away your old drugs, you know. Kids experiment with uh, drugs that they see their parents using. And uh, as I've said before, the reason we need childproof packaging is usually because of parents leaving stuff around, not because you need it actually in the dispensary. I don't know of any cases of kids going into dispensaries and trying to rip open those blue or red candies that they always go on about as being too attractive to children. <laughs> but if they're left around the house, for sure, that's why it might happen. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I'm rambling on, as uh, lawyers tend to do, uh, some lawyers, um, Pets, animals, we've got to now get on the issue of uh, getting back the ability of veterinarians to be able to prescribe cannabis to people's pets. So that's another thought that we have is that if you uh, have a veterinarian who is familiar with cannabis as medicine and there's books on it and, and vets used to be able to prescribe it, although I don't think they, not many of them did, uh, the changes to Section 53 of the Narcotic Control Act uh, took that power away in relation to cannabis. But there is this demand, and, and there are uh, web pages out there uh, uh, that currently exist in terms of products for animals and pets. And so the issue would be that if your uh, vet approves, medically approves this for your pet or animal or whatever, then the, the owner of the pet, uh, is entitled to get reasonable access uh, on behalf of the pet, uh, you know, along those lines. That, so trying to connect finally the humans and the animals on this issue. <laughs> well, so um, I think, again, my big message is uh, let's just show them that... Uh, Four plants, 100 centimeters tall, and uh, that maybe are bushier than they maybe anticipate. Um, that may be folded down, or you know, I don't know what the police are going to do with tape measures on their belts or something. You know, it's such a, a waste of resources. But again, it's this fear of the black market or fear. You know, some people would prefer to grow one monster plant, presumably, and that's it. Um, and the whole indoor-outdoor thing, it, it seems like you're going to be able to do it outdoor because the dwelling house definition includes the perimeter. 
or a building on the land and so on. So uh, let's see how that works, the ticketing scheme for minor violations, and we'll see just what happens in terms of their use of the criminal law because that's all against a backdrop, I'm afraid, that is still there and contains many offenses and, and uh, you're not going to be able to get a jury trial for some of them because it's five years less one day and the Constitution says you only have a right to a jury trial when it's five years and up. <laughs> Imagine... The, you know, what, what, why would they do that? Do they have lack of faith in the fact that a jury of ordinary people randomly picked might simply say, uh-uh, you know? <laughs> it's called jury nullification, and we lawyers aren't allowed to stand up and encourage jurors to, uh, to disregard the law. The law is for the judge. So, uh, but it's an interesting uh, thing. Anyway, again, I'm... Rambling on, thank you very much. Uh, normal has existed for a long time uh, in order to try and advance the cause. And I have to say that, uh, you know, finally, we, uh, since 1977, we uh, incorporated then, existed uh, before that in an unincorporated form. And, and here we are, 45 years later, uh, they are going to legalize cannabis and people are going to be able to possess up to 30 grams most of us, I don't think, need to pack more than 30 grams unless it's a holiday or things like that, which they never seem to take into account. But, um, you know, we, we are going there and we're going to get there. And the genie does not get put back in the bottle. It, it is not, there's no going back once we go there. And we have an opportunity to demonstrate that we can do it well in Canada so that many of these other places that have quasi-legalized and so on see that it can be done in a large country and be done well without, uh, with minimal consequences to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, John, and thank you for all your hard work over all these years. We can't there's no way that you're not a huge part in uh, bringing us to legalization here. And you're right. I think sometimes we just got to remind ourselves that this is like awesome. No matter what, it's just awesome. All right. And then we'll nitpick after. So thank you all for being here. Really awesome day. Thank Vapor Central for hosting. Um, thank you, John, again. Another big round of applause. Expert Joints for streaming. Sarah Hanlon for making it happen. Pod TV, Cannabis Culture, great. Facebook. You all know her. Check out Flats Hanlon on social media. And uh, expert joints on social media. Check out the live streams. They're uh, archived, as yes. we say. Yes, live streams from yesterday and today available on pot.tv. Also, pot TV YouTube page, uh, Facebook, Cannabis Culture, as well as we stream the award show from down at the uh, uh, grounds at 512 Church. So that's available on there, too. So check it all out, the replay. Thanks for having me, and thanks for coming out to the Karma Cup 2017. Sarah, you're awesome. Thanks for holding down to the Normal Conference. And Normal Canada, you're doing it, killing yeah, it. Yeah, thank you, Normal. Thank you, everybody. And with that, the 2017 Karma oh, Cup wraps oh, up. Of That's course. It. Appreciate y'all being here. Enjoy oh, the time at Vapor Central. We forgot Abby. We forgot Abby. Oh. Abby Sampson, thank you yes, so much. Yes, Abby, please. Everybody every, makes it Every happen. year just doing all this work for us and bringing it to Vapor Central, it Fantastic. means a lot to us. So we'll see you all next year. Thank you. <laughs>